Hello everyone, thanks for watching this talk today. My name is Marina Sessin, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida, and today I'm going to talk to you about our work on multiphysics mesoscale modeling of ablative thermal protection systems. So first, I would like to acknowledge our collaborators at the University of Florida and the ESI NASA grant that this work is funded by. Thermal protection systems, they are essentially the heat shield of a spacecraft. Very recently, we were able to witness the craft that took the rover Perseverance to, the, to Mars. And the heat shield is this material that goes uh, right here at the tip during the atmospheric entry. The material we are investigating is called PICA. It's a phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. And essentially, we have carbon fibers dispersed in a phenolic resin. And if we look at this material after uh, an atmospheric entry, we can see that the microstructure is left with some exposed fibers at the very top. And throughout the material for the like in thickness of the sample, for example, we are left with some char, which is the product when the resin burns out. And still we can see some virgin resin at the bottom. And the purpose of this material, of course, is to protect what is inside. So the bottom doesn't really get hotter than uh, room temperature, but the very top gets really hot and the heat fluxes can be over a thousand watts per centimeter square. But the microstructure is engineered to protect against all this heat and uh, supersonic heat flow. So we have the carbon fibers dispersed in the resin. We have this image uh, from Natalie and we can see that they are randomly oriented. However, uh, they are sort of um, compressed and uh, in the in thickness plane, they are biased towards that direction. So the infra thickness of this material has a very poor thermal conductivity, which is what we want to insulate. And the, the plane um, has a, a higher thermal conductivity because the fibers are oriented in that plane. And this is because each one of these fibers are essentially folded graphene sheets. And graphene has a very high thermal conductivity in its pure um, two-dimensional form. And the thermal conductivity in the longitudinal direction of a fiber can be 100 times higher than the radial direction. We can even engineer this microstructure even further and come up with uh, very efficient structures such as this woven concept that protects the microstructure even more. But we have to understand how all these processes, they are playing at the microstructure level to be able to perform um, new microstructure designs such as this uh, woven one. And that's essentially the research question that we are trying to answer in our projects is how all these microstructure features and also their thermophysical properties, how all of this affects the final ablation rate of the PICA thermal protection system. And we know that all of these processes are highly temperature dependent. We have high temperatures at the surface, mild temperatures at the, um, at the middle section of the PICA. And we want to develop a model that can capture all the chemical reactions that are happening, the microstructure evolution, but that is also coupled with the temperature to be able to capture this um, uh, heterogeneous temperature behavior throughout the thickness. And we can also calculate effective properties using this model uh, to be useful at higher length scale models. They used homogenized properties um, at the, the mesoscale level. So first, I'm going to talk to you about all the physics that are going on in the material and then talk about how we implement our model. The ablation, uh, when we talk about ablation, we are talking about the outermost part of the TPS. And in this figure, it would be this section. And what we have there is we have um, the gas, the flow that's coming through the atmosphere, we have the char, and we have the carbon fibers. And essentially, this char is, has a lower density and it reacts faster than these fibers. So in the presence of heat and the reactant here, uh, oxygen, this char is gonna recede uh, and expose these fibers. Later, these fibers are gonna oxidize and espalate. And that's the process that we talk about when we talk about ablation. The second process that is going on is the pyrolysis. 
And the pyrolysis is the transformation of the phenolic resin into char. And it happens in a, the middle section of the sample around here. And it's represented more or less by this uh, SEM structure. And here we have the char, we have the fibers, we have the resin, and essentially this resin is just going to go through sort of a phase transformation, uh, but it's driven by chemical reactions and transform into char, also in the presence of heat and oxygen at lower temperatures uh, than the ablation. And a, a good thing about this is that the gases products that are generated because of the endothermic nature of this reaction, they help uh, to cool down this material and they are essential for the insulation properties. So what we are doing is we are developing a multi-physics model to capture all this phenomena um, that I was talking about. And we base our model on a phase field ground potential model. I'm not going to get into the details, but essentially in the phase field method, we have continuous variables throughout the domain and they changed uh, over the interfaces smoothly. We have each chemical species modeled by a number density variable, and they follow a generalized diffusion equation. And this way we can capture uh, the diffusion of the species throughout the domain. We represent, we represent our microstructure features through order parameters. And if you uh, recall this image that I have been showing you, I have all these um, ADAs here and these are the parameters they are one inside the phase they're representing and zero outside. So for example, gas, it's one in this blue phase and zero in the fiber, zero in the char, uh, zero in the resin and so on. And they follow an Allen kind of equation. And with this, we can model uh, the microstructure evolution, how the surfaces recede and how this phase is uh, played out in the system. We couple our phase field model with a chemical reaction kinetics model and we basically implement a fine array chemistry model. So we take the, um, the time evolution of the species due to the chemical reactions and either a reactant or a product, it depends on all the reactants involved uh, in the reaction here. I'm just showing uh, two reactants, but this could um, be a, a higher order reaction. And we implemented this uh, together uh, with the generalized diffusion. So basically we add the contribution from the chemical reactions that are going on to the contribution from the, from the diffusion part. On top of all of this, we couple with the heat conduction. And essentially our feedback here is that the local temperature informs the physical properties and how the microstructure plays out informs um, what are the thermal properties for the heat conduction. And we solve the transient heat conduction. We also add the endothermic effect here as the reaction energy. So whenever we have endothermic reactions, we are essentially adding a heat sink um, to this equation. Um, in addition to all of this, I think the most important part of implementing the heat conduction is that all the chemical reactions the reaction rate constant is a function of temperature. So it's very important that we have different local temperatures throughout the domain because that reaction rate is going to depend on that. Uh, we implement all this model in a non-dimensional form, uh, the diffusion, the chemical reactions, the microstructure evolution, and the heat conduction. And we create an, an application based on the MOOS framework. It's an open source, nonlinear, finite element method solver, and you can find it at moosframework.org. So after we implemented this model, the first step was to verify it. So we first compare it to a simple gas reaction model. And for this case, we have a domain with um, carbon and oxygen atoms. It's just a one phase gas domain. And these are these uh, reactants are going to form carbon monoxide. Here we are only mod modeling uh, carbon plus oxygen um, yielding carbon monoxide for simplicity. And for this, um, for this scenario, we can model this pretty easily just using a, a finite rate uh, equation. And we start with equal amounts of oxygen and carbon. So uh, we can write the equation out in this form, uh, just substituting because they are equal. And we can also uh, plot a linear um, 
relationship of uh, one of the concentrations with time and the slope of that uh, linear plot should yield the reaction rate constant that we passed um, to the phase field model. And this way we can compare if the reaction that we passed is what we are seeing. And yes, our phase field model in Moose compared pretty well with this analytical model for just a gas reaction. Here at the scatter dots uh, will be always the Moose simulation and the red uh, linear plots are the analytical models. We had a great comparison with this one. The next step was to verify how our model behaves with a surface reaction, because the oxidation of the carbon fibers, they actually happen on the surface. So we have a rate limiting step that, you know, this oxygens they have to adsorb, react, and the products have to desorb. We do not model adsorption and desorption in phase field, but we still have this um, rate limiting step that we have to somehow incorporate. And they're gonna react on the surface to form carbon monoxide. There is a trick part here because the phase field is a diffuse interface model. So we want to compare how we do, but there were no uh, available models that would uh, include a diffuse interface. Therefore, we developed our own. So for a 1D scenario, a very simple model, we, de we developed an analytical solution for how the total amount of species is going to evolve with time. So this is the domain. Uh, we have a solid carbon phase on the left. We have a gas phase on the right. We start with pure oxygen and that changes into carbon monoxide. And we have a diffuse interface with a characteristic uh, thickness of a uh, delta interface. We take the contribution from the chemical reaction. Uh, since our uh, boundaries are closed, the the diffusion part of the equation is conserved. So we can only um, look into the contribution from the chemical reaction. And all of this, um, all of these number densities, they follow a smooth profile over the interface. And we can represent that with a hyperbolic tangent equation. So essentially we plug in all the dependencies, the spatial dependencies of this number densities, we integrate over space and time. And now we can predict how the total amount of oxygen or, or carbon monoxide is going to um, uh, evolve during our simulation. Uh, we also consider that we have an infinite amount of carbon, so the carbon profile isn't changed. We are just looking at the gas profile here. A great thing that came out of this is that it became very clear how our simulation is dependent on the interface width. And we don't want that, right? Although the phase field method has an intrinsic diffuse interface, we don't want our results to be dependent on that. So we now normalize the reaction rate constant uh, with the interface width, and we obtain results that are independent. And we compare pretty well. Uh, the scatter dots are again the most simulation, Red line is the analytical model that we developed. On the left, uh, we see the total amount of um, oxygen in the system decreasing with time. And we can plot the logarithm of that um, number density and also the, um, the atomic fraction because our model is non-dimensional. So they are essentially the same value. And we can compare the slope that we get from the Mu simulation with the slope of the analytical model. And that gives us our error. But most importantly, now our results are independent of interface thickness because this one we ran with a half micron interface thickness and the same results for a one micron are the same. Uh, we can also show that our error, uh, the error I mentioned, the difference between the slope from the scatter uh, MUS data with the analytical model it decreases with an increasing amount of mesh elements. So an increasing mesh refinement. And the slope of our log log plot is a negative 2.1. So it decreases pretty well. So after we implemented all, all the model we verified, now we want to look into how each parameter is uh, affecting our model. Essentially, we want to look at the sensitivities. And we ran a uh, 1D sensitivity uh, analysis. We did uh, over 2,000 phase field simulations assembles. 
we impose a standard deviation of 10% of the means for each one. And for that, we use the software Dakota. And here I uh, have the cloud plots. They are uh, a bit overwhelming, but my point here is just to show you that mostly all the physical properties and model parameters, they have a very low sensitivity. And we have these two ones here that stand out. They are the exponential factor of the Ahina's equation for the reaction rate constant and the activation energy. And it becomes a bit more clear when I show you the bar plot. And here are the sensitivities. They are normalized uh, with their means. And then we normalized again with the highest sensitivity, which was the activation energy. And we can see that the parameters uh, that affect the chemical reaction kinetics are um, the ones that are most impactful. And here we also have the diffusion coefficients and the parameters that go into the free energies of our phase fit model, and they don't have a uh, very high sensitivity, which is good because we have um, realistic values for our defect formation energies, but the parabolic ones, they are model parameters, so we don't want them to have a high sensitivity. We also have the heat conduction input parameters and they don't play uh, an important role. However, I must say that uh, this temperature, there is no heat flow coming in. It starts at a constant temperature and the only temperature difference comes from the endothermic effect. So I would not expect them to play a very important role in the simulation either. And lastly, we have uh, the surface energy that impacts the microstructure evolution. And since this is a 1D domain, I would also not expect this to have a high sensitivity because there is no curvature driving force. This is going to be more important when we look into the 2D sensitivities in the future. So now that we looked into all of these model parameters and everything's looking good, um, the sensitivities are what we wanted and expected, we can start modeling uh, more challenging domains. Uh, however, if you recall that I told you that the carbon fibers there highly anisotropic with regards to their thermal conductivity, we need to account for that. So the way we do this is um, we separate the carbon fibers in our domain and we do a, a pre-simulation uh, step one in which we use a heat flow simulation. Uh, we apply a hot temperature on the left boundary and we apply a cold temperature on the right boundary and we apply a much higher thermal conductivity in the fibers than in the bulk, all isotropic. And because of the difference, the heat is going to flow through this um, carbon fibers. And we can then use the direction of the heat flow to calculate the direction vectors of these fibers. And we can use the direction vector to use that as a guide to rotate the coordinate system of the thermal conductivity and isotropic tensor. So we use this to perform the rotation. And on the next simulation that we do, the carbon fibers are going to have the correct tensors. And this is an example of how it looks like. Uh, it's pretty ac accurate. And it's a pretty cheap way. It worked well for our phase field simulation. So that was good. And with all of this implemented, we can start observing how this plays out into the simulations. So here on the left, we have a vertical fiber, and on the right, a 45 degree fiber. And we can see the temperature um, changing throughout the direction of the fiber. And we can see how uh, it was important to model the anisotropy of the thermal conductivity, especially when we look into multiple fibers. And this is very interesting because you're going to see that the temperature um, is going to flow through these fibers. And the regions that are hotter are going to oxidize first because the reaction rate constant is a function of temperature and later the fibers that were in the cooler region. So um, in conclusion, we analyzed what are all the phenomena happening at the ablation. We implemented our model uh, using phase field chemical reaction kinetics and coupled with heat conduction. We verified our model, we analyzed the sensitivities for the physical properties and the model parameters, and we are st started applying this 
um, to more complex structures, uh, multi-fiber simulations. As a uh, future work for our project, we aim to um, include the char to model the multi-phase ablation, and we are also modeling the pyrolysis. Finally, I would like to acknowledge our uh, friends at the Tonks Research Group and our collaborators, Joshua Monk and Najim Mansour and Nasa Ames. Also, thanks to Hypergator, uh, where I ran mostly all my simulations. Thank you so much for watching. Um, feel free to contact me for email. I will be uh, looking at the chat for this TMS presentation, but feel free to, uh, feel free to reach out to me whenever. Thank you so much.